So good uh, morning or good afternoon and uh, good evening colleagues uh, from wherever that you are joining us from. Uh, welcome to this uh, session on UNODC data explained on drugs. Uh, my name is Billy Batwer and I'm a program officer at the UN Office on Drugs and Crime here in Vienna. Um, so before we start, I just wanted to inform you that uh, this session is being interpreted. We have uh, simultaneous interpretation in Arabic, French, and Spanish. Uh, you can, of course, choose to listen to any of those uh, three languages um, for, by, by going to the uh, um, interpretation selection menu on your bottom left of your screen. So I hope that all of you can see that. And my colleague, uh, Sarah, has already tested, so everything should be working. Uh, please do remember to mute the original video when you choose the language that you want to listen to so that you avoid background interference. So I think we all know, of course, the importance of data and uh, data is for us at UNODC um, uh, a key aspect of our work uh, because it guides our evidence-based support to member states but also, if, of course, it guides all our interventions around the world. Without data, basically, I usually say that we are like blindfolded people walking towards a burning fire. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, the burning fire will be so many uh, challenges that we face in the context of the war drug problem. Um, so when uh, we say, of course, supporting member states in our perspective, what we also understand is that uh, we are supporting the wider society which make up those member states and uh, most of them of course who are mostly affected by the world drug problems 
and civil society organizations in this particular case play a very important place, an important role in supporting governments in their commitments. So therefore, uh, uh, the data uh, that UNODC collects and it disseminates uh, amongst member states, but also interested stakeholders is of utmost importance for the work uh, that civil society organizations do, especially, of course, those organizations that engage with UNODC directly. It helps you to engage uh, with uh, your government and us at UNODC, but hopefully, most importantly, also it helps you to uh, implement your own activities. So therefore, this series of data explained is very important for us uh, to share with you uh, the approach and the principles governing the data production within UNODC uh, as implemented by uh, our research branch, which is, of course, very well represented here. Uh, the research branch at UNODC leads the organization to work in collecting and analyzing data that is essential for evidence uh, to inform policy making of member states. Uh, this initiative was introduced, of course, to further strengthen a meaningful engagement with you, the civil society organizations, in the work that UNODC does. So um, I almost dare to say that uh, the importance of, of this initiative is also demonstrated by uh, the sheer interest that we have received. You may be interested to know that we have received about 400 participants or at least registered people for this event. And we already have almost 100 of you already present at this particular point. So I will introduce my colleagues who are going to take you through the event. But before I do that, I just wanted to give you some, some uh, housekeeping information. And uh, um, throughout the session, as, uh, as, as we would like this to be very interactive as much as possible, we will use Slido questions. So we will use some questions throughout the session to make sure that we interact with you. So please uh, do use your smartphone or a tablet aside to the computers that you may be using in order to, you, uh, to interact with those questions. If you wish to speak uh, or make a comment, uh, please raise your virtual hand. And we can do that uh, by just clicking on raise hand just at the bottom of your screen, and we will let you to the floor. And finally, for questions, uh, uh, we would like to encourage you to use the Q&A section of the Zoom so that we can separate questions from comments, because we are thinking that we will have a lot of comments, so, and we will try to address those uh, questions as we go. So now I think is the moment that you all are here for and you have been waiting for. And um, I'm pleased to give uh, uh, the mic because it's not the floor, we're not in the same room, to my first colleague who is uh, Chloe uh, Carpentier, who is the chief uh, of the drug research section. And she will share with you the key data on drugs, why they are needed, and how we use them. And for this, uh, Chloe uh, prepared already three questions for you. Chloe, so if, if you could come in here as we prepare these questions for the audience, please. Thank you, Billy. Good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, this is a bit of a first for us all to organize this session on, uh, on, uh, on drugs data. So. Um, so I will, uh, I will basically introduce you to uh, a bit of, um, of the overall concept, I would say, and um, the different aspects uh, that are perhaps uh, are related to drug data uh, and why, why we collect drug data, what are the, the main types of drug data we collect and, uh, and what we do with them. But this in a, in a quite, uh, I would say quite, um, broad way. And then my colleagues, uh, Enrico and his team, will follow up with uh, perhaps being a bit more precise about some of the data we collect. They are the main part, but they're not the only ones. And, and he, they will be referring to the data we collect through regular, reg, uh, sorry, regular uh, data collection mechanism, if, uh, if uh, yeah. So uh, the first point I would like to address with you is why collecting data on the drug problem? And to make it a bit more interactive, I think the best is that you try to answer this question. So Billy and team, I think this is your, your moment to share on the screen the question and how everyone can 
answer the question. This is open. Just put the keywords you think about why we, we collect data on the drug problem. Why collecting data on the drug problem? No, it's not, the, this, the question is not correct, Billy. The question is why collecting data on the drug problem? Sorry, there is a mistake. If you just reverse the order of the first two, Billy. Why yeah. collecting data on the drug problem? Yeah. Yes. So hopefully the answers will come on the screen. Exactly. Please do go to Slido if, if you know how Slido works. Otherwise, just type in Slido. Um, and uh, you should be able then to uh, log into the system and... Uh, Billy, the question is not correct. It keeps changing and is not the correct one. The I'm question sorry, keeps but, changing. Yes, participants will be confused. Okay, let's uh, let's try to fix this, Chloe. Um, sometimes uh, the IT, we think that we, we know how to use it, but uh, it plays some tricks with us. I'll post the question. In okay, we are going to basically post the question also in the chat just to make sure. And uh, we will still be able to receive the answers on the Slido. So we will put the, the link to Slido in the chat right now. And as well as the, the question, the correct question in a chat, just to make sure exactly that is what Chloe just put in there. And we will put the link to Slido as well. Yes. Can we do that? Bear with us, colleagues, uh, please. There's, there you go. So there's a link to Slido. Please go to this particular link. Uh, and you will find this question there in Slido already and uh, provide your answers. And then we'll be able to display those answers. So Chloe, uh, colleagues have already received uh, the link and the question. So in, in, we, we give them about a minute to do that. Yeah, we can see already some uh, some answers coming through. Is it possible we can share these answers on the screen? These are already shared on the screen. Ah, okay, perfect. Yes, we can see. Perfect, perfect. So basically, you will see that uh, the, the more, um, yeah, exactly. So, so the more words that we get, basically, the, the more cloudy, let's say, the, the, the environment is going to be. And it's quite fascinating to see how interactive this, this system is. Um, as people <laughs> as people answer answer these questions. So to establish evidence for scientific accountability, now it has disappeared. <laughs> yes, uh, it's very difficult to read. To guide interventions and best practice, to track trends, supply trafficking. Uh, to measure progress or change and for scientific accountability. I think this is, this is sufficient for now. Let me just recap a bit. So why we collect data on the drug problem before we go to the second question. So uh, because data, whether they are quantitative or qualitative are really the foundation of stone to produce sound and authoritative knowledge on drugs. Huh? And why do we need sound and authoritative knowledge on drugs? For uh, evidence-based policy making, some of, of you have mentioned that. Uh, I mean, to develop policies, to develop strategies uh, and programs that are based on evidence, and which itself is uh, produced from objective, reliable and relevant data, but also to evaluate uh, the outcome and the impact of such uh, policies and programs, and also to allocate uh, resources to uh, specific priority areas. So we need data for all these, uh, these different reasons. So the objective here are multiple, eh? and uh, we need them to identify emerging trends at an early stage so we can react, 
to share also information on best practices uh, for the planning and the organization of uh, the interventions, both on in the demand reduction side and the supply reduction, and to provide decision makers with uh, the sound evidence they need for uh, the design of national and regional uh, drug strategies and their evaluation. And of course, there is also an ultimate objective, which is to contribute to uh, the international monitoring of the drug problem and to uh, the policy debate on drugs with, of course, sound evidence based on good data. So now we come to the second question, which is about, um, so how do we do that? What are the data? What are the different types of data that uh, we need and that uh, we collect? So this is the second question, Billy. Please. Is that correct? Is that correct, Chloe? Is that the correct yes. answer? Perfect. Yes, Perfect. it's correct. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. So we, we wait again uh, a, a minute or so, and we will start seeing that uh, um, information coming in. So there we go. We, we get, have already the first response. So yes, we collect data on drug seizures. What else? And what type of data to? On drug use, yes. A question, do we collect only government data? No. Type of drugs used? Yes. On the prevalence, the rate of use in the population, on the people uh, being treated for drug use disorders? on drug demand reduction interventions, yes. On different policies and, uh, and legislation. On wastewater, yes, on, on uh, from wastewater analysis, on uh, drug consumption. On the age, gender of people uh, using drugs. Someone mentioned indirect, yes. Some, many of the indicators of the data are indirect indicators. On drug use patterns, on flows, trafficking flows, on different profiles of, uh, of actors in the, in the drug supply chain, including uh, users, but not only. Data can be local or national or supranational. We also collect data on the content of syringes, but also on the on the on the number of syringes which are being handed over to to drug users, etc. So I, I think we can stop here, Billy, and let me recap a bit on the different elements that I've shown here. And I'm very happy that the, the a number of uh, of elements that show. So first. Um, it's important to realize that by data, we mean both quantitative and qualitative data. So we do collect and we do use and we see the merit in both quantitative and qualitative data. Quantitative are those that are measurable and the qualitative, this is more the data that come out of uh, qualitative research, such as interviews of focus groups, etc. But also expert uh, opinions as uh, reflected in some of the question of the annual report questionnaire. We do, another point that was not mentioned here is that we do mostly collect data in an aggregated form, but not only. We also collect data about individual cases, individual events. And, and this is also important because they give another perspective on the phenomenon. By aggregated, I mean uh, the sum of a number of events or, or, or behaviors in a, in a, in a time frame. Individual cases are each one, one case or event. Then someone mentioned also with a question mark, 
whether only official, uh, officially reported data. No, we collect data. Some are officially reported, yes, by government entities. Others come from open source. They're open source data. Uh, and um, then there is also another, another, another aspect I would like to mention, and that most of the data we collect are secondary data, which means they have been collected by someone else before. So they were reported by others, including government, but not only. Uh, but we also do, at UNODC, uh, do uh, implement uh, primary data collection. So through, uh, for example, drug use surveys, or through uh, surveys of illicit crops, et cetera, or even uh, interviews that we may, uh, we may carry out. Uh, in terms of the data that are open source, they may come from, uh, from the scientific literature, which we call, which basically are the peer reviewed journals, or they may come for what we call uh, commonly the gray literature. And this is basically everything else. It can be national reports, which are also official, officially published by uh, authorities in the member states, maybe reports by um, non-governmental non agencies, reports by uh, UNODC or the UN uh, agencies or papers, etc. So we really scan everything and we extract data, relevant data from all these type of uh, sources. We collect data and this was shown in the, in the responses both on uh, drug demand and uh, drug supply. We collect data on drug markets, where there is an intersection of the two. Uh, and uh, at each stage, each stage, I would say, of the drug supply chain, eh, from cultivation or manufacture via trafficking and distribution to uh, consumer markets, and also on consequences of these different uh, drug activities. So in terms of substantive coverage, it's extremely large. Uh, one thing important that uh, I think someone mentioned, there was a keyword uh, indirect. Yes, drug behaviors and uh, events, drug events, are most often either illicit or they are, they may not be illicit, but they, of, they often do not take place overtly, which means that uh, there are not many data or indicators which are direct indicators of the phenomenon. So we have a lot of indirect indicators of the phenomenon or indications. And many of them are also byproducts of other processes. Eh? And in particular, I would, I would say here, I would mention counter narcotic activities. This is very important. For example, seizures data, they're a byproduct of law enforcement activity. If you think about um, people in treatment for drug use disorders, this is also a byproduct of uh, an activity, which is uh, uh, treatment services, which is uh, being uh, implemented. So uh, the data that are produced are actually produced often at the point of the interventions by the state or by others. And this is also very important to, to consider and uh, whether on the demand or on the supply side, and they may reflect uh, the priorities and the resources uh, of, uh, of these uh, interventions or, or, or the actors behind the interventions. Um, rather than being a true or unbiased uh, reflection of the drug problem. So this is also something important. The way these data are generated will have an impact on, uh, on, uh, on what we will see, basically. So we need to take them with great caution. And now I come to the third question, and which is about what do we do with these data on drugs? And I leave you the floor, please. The That's question right. is correct, yes. It's, it's correct, excellent. And, and Chloe, in the meantime, uh, please, if you have a chance uh, to look into the chat, there's a question for you there from Kenzie. So you could reflect on that question uh, on, uh, I believe, on, on whether we collect also data related to the environment um, in that direction. So if you could reflect on that in the meantime as well, please.
Okay, and Chloe, feel free to already start intervening on us. So many in interesting uh, question, uh, answers that are coming through already. I see some, there are even numbers in those questions. I'm not even sure I know what they mean. So many mentioned uh, that we publish or we put together with draft reports with uh, this data. We use them to improve interventions and uh, for uh, best practice. We may use them to uh, develop guidelines for uh, policymakers. Someone has mentioned the drug report. I imagine, I, I imagine you mean the World Drug Report. Uh, some have mentioned uh, potential audiences, governments, and uh, now I don't see it. Uh, yeah. Uh, government and public outreach and uh, monitoring the effectiveness of policies, evaluation for evidence-based policy making, etc. So I think uh, let me perhaps recap a bit. I think most of is here of what is here was already mentioned in uh, in response to the um, to the first question. But what I, where I want to go now is more about what we do exactly with this data. A bit the intermediary. Uh, the intermediary process. So the first thing we do is that we check the quality. And this is extremely important because there's a lot of uh, sources and, and data and, and, uh, and data types, and they are not all of the same, uh, same quality. So we need to check whether they are reliable, whether they are objective, what is the methodology of each uh, data set and how it was produced. And if there is any limitation or bias, we need to understand these limitations and bias. And it doesn't mean that we will discard uh, this data because in some cases, they may be the only ones that we have or are available, or are available on a country or on a specific um, substantive issue, et cetera. But they need to be treated with uh, the caution that is required. So we need ourselves to understand the data generation, the data production process, and how, how good they may be at the end, so that this informs uh, the interpretation and the analysis of, the data, of this data. I mentioned before the issue of indirect data, indirect indicators, and, and this means, and it's something very important, that most of the analysis that uh, is then uh, um, derived from this data is based on the triangulation of uh, different data as none of them is usually a true or direct uh, reflection of the phenomenon and may be uh, also influenced by other factors. So this is also very important. So we look at a lot of different data before coming to any conclusion or interpretation. Um, it is also uh, very important to remain open eh, in terms of uh, looking at different uh, data sets, even some that are less conventional, for example, some have mentioned wastewater. Wastewater is something that came up in the few last years. I mean, last uh, five to 10 years, I would say. It's not that recent, but it's still recent in, in, in drug epidemiology. And this is a way to look at harm because we look at the consumption of, uh, I mean, the volume of drug that is being consumed in a different, um, different uh, countries or different cities. Um, but at the same time, we need to exercise a great deal of scrutiny and uh, quality checks to ensure that we understand uh, the potential biases. I've also or, or already mentioned that. And of course, also uh, to correct misreporting. Uh, this is something that perhaps Enrico and team will mention, but it's not, it's, not, um, it's not unseen that even in official reporting, uh, uh, we may have uh, reporting of seizures in kilos, whereas we should have, it should have been grams. And this will have a very, very big impact uh, on the, then on the trends or the total. So our first job is also to go back to the country sometimes and to check with them whether what we, we get is within an expected range. And any of the outliers, I mean, the, the, the values that would be outside of this range would need to be uh, investigated uh, a bit further. Now, based on all the data collected, uh, but first and foremost, starting from research questions, because this is the way we proceed in terms of analysis, uh, then we try to answer these questions. Usually it's about uh, patterns of use, trafficking, cultivation, etc., and changes in this uh, over time, but also geographically. 
in these uh, different patterns, looking also at actors, methods, I mean, actors being uh, can be users, but also traffickers, uh, can be methods of administration of use, but also methods of trafficking, etc. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we work both on demand and supply, but what we have increasingly um, strived to, to produce is really now more and more a holistic uh, analysis of the drug supply chain uh, and the drug problem as a whole, including also uh, looking at the intersections uh, with other areas, for example, the intersection between uh, drugs and organized crime, between drugs and corruption, or between drugs and illicit financial flows. And also more and more, uh, the, we are striving to look also at the potential impact of the drug problem or the impact of the drug problem on different areas. Eh? For example, society, health, both individual health and uh, public health, on economy, on uh, public safety, on governance and uh, the rule of law, and on environment. But this, I, I only cite a few here, just as an example. And something I wanted perhaps to end up with is that um, I've just mentioned impact, eh? to look at the impact where impact analysis are very complex. Eh? And, uh, and this is something we want to do more and more, but uh, it's very complex um, in particularly because uh, we try to ascribe uh, to a certain outcome, a certain program or policy. And uh, this is very difficult in fact to do beyond a simple uh, time correlation. So causation is very difficult to demonstrate in social sciences in general, but still we are trying now to build uh, the data and, uh, and the analytical power that we have at UNODC to more and more uh, produce knowledge that will uh, equip policymakers to, to comment on the impact of certain programs and policies. Thank you very much. And now is the turn of Enrico and his team to delve a bit uh, more into the, the data set that is being collected by UNODC directly from member states. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chloe, for, for that and, and <laughs> for setting the scene, but also for painting um, uh, the picture of uh, not only the importance, but also the complexity of, uh, of data collection from the UNODC perspective, which also, I think, explains uh, the, the importance why we need to, to, uh, to keep collecting more and more and engage uh, these stakeholders and involve them uh, uh, and inform them on how we do this. And um, so I think that's that's a very good starting point and you really painted uh, a big picture and, and set uh, a good uh, stage for Enrico to come in basically. And um, Enrico, he, he will then uh, basically at this particular point, go as you said, uh, Chloe into details to, to introduce um, that, the data process itself, right? And, and, and how that is processed uh, together with his team. And we do have a question also for Enrico to, to go uh, to start his presentation. I think, do, do we have a question to answer first? Um, yes, uh, so there is Lily Gundaka who asks, Lee? do you think, uh, do you look at family situation and drug use? Chloe, well? Chloe, perhaps, uh, can you take this before Enrico, if you could uh, give us a second so that Chloe could answer this question. Do you look at family situation and, dr and drug use basically? Yeah, of course. We look at everything. Now, the way we look may differ. Some of the data, some of the focus may be part of the annual data collection mechanism through the annual report questionnaire that Enrico and his team will introduce. And others may be more uh, in depth uh, analysis for which we would uh, extract data from literature and other sources. And then if, if we have a special analyst coming out on, uh, for example, family and drug use, et cetera, then this will be covered. And for this, I point to you, for example, the special, uh, the thematic booklet of the World Drug Report 2020, which, look at, which looked at the socioeconomic uh, characteristic or conditions and, and drugs and uh, drug activities, mostly drug use. And then you would have a bit on this, for example. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chloe, for that. Uh, and Eko, please uh, take it away. Uh, take it from there. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Billy. Uh, 
Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon to all those who are connected with us. It's really a pleasure uh, to, yeah, to be given this possibility and this opportunity to talk to you, to uh, this uh, beautiful community of uh, civil society organizations uh, uh, working on drug issues. Uh, I'm following up with uh, what uh, Chloe just said on, in terms of, uh, you know, of uh, the specific, more specific um, data uh, processes, uh, data procedures and the contents, and also something on what we are doing to also to innovate this. Um, so that, and that there will be a few colleagues, three colleagues from our section that will uh, again, give you some uh, more specific information, share some more specific information. But before doing that, uh, um, if you can uh, already, we have prepared a, a small question just to have a, a kind of a send of, sense of a feeling from you, uh, from you colleagues uh, about um, what you think, um, what you think about, uh, you know, the C data on drugs currently yeah yeah based on your you know experience or uh, direct or indirect you know uh, yeah maybe it's a, yeah that's the question yeah what do you think about you know to see data on drugs so while you yeah you think a moment uh, about this the first thing that comes to mind huh? don't don't think too much don't think too much just uh, press the button that is closest to your uh, to your uh, view opinion you know, this uh, data uh, on, uh, on drugs, as uh, um, Chloe uh, was saying, are, you know, is a, is a, we say, a, a, an, an important, uh, is a kind of a world in itself, huh? is a, a micro, a micro world, is a, is a system. Uh, there are many, uh, and you will see a little bit of them, many uh, topics many different sources and uh, what makes this um, and this you can say that is a, a happens in many areas of our life of our, our economy of our society but what makes the drugs very specific and very unique is that of course we should never forget this is an a kind of illegal illicit uh, um, often uh, behaviors so um, it's often this uh, of, uh, has a big impact on the data because, of course, uh, it's we uh, there are issues like you know people are not uh, very willing to, to disclose what they are doing. Uh, many data uh, we don't have data on trade of drugs. We don't simply go to the customs to ask for data as we can do for many other goods and so on. So you know you have to understand that the fact that this is illicit of course these activities are illicit um, of course has a big impact on the on the data and that uh, we try our best to of course to uh, collect what is available and make a sense of interpret the data in the best possible way so i'm, I'm seeing uh, a number of answers coming so yeah uh, good many uh, Many of you saying that uh, um, these data are import, miss important information. Many of you saying that they, these data are influenced by national data policies. Uh, yeah, it's good to see that there is a, a reasonable, a good share of people thinking that the overall uh, the data are quite good. Um, but again, there are others saying, of course, underlying. Uh, uh, shortages, weaknesses, but also, yeah, somebody saying that they are uh, complex, difficult to understand. Okay, so um, we are very much aware of these uh, challenges, yeah, of uh, of uh, weaknesses of uh, in certain areas, for example, or in certain regions. We will talk about this. Um, the issue of uh, you know what whether the the data are. Um, really uh, um, you know uh, of good quality we can say or they're influenced by in, in a way by by national authority is also at the top of our you know priorities and so also on that um, yeah we have some uh, some processes in place to make um, to make this happen and uh, 
And before, again, I, I give the, 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 um, the floor to my colleagues. One thing that I, um, there are two elements we always uh, uh, take into account in all our data process. One is a quality. Uh, it's our, this is a quality in the most, uh, in the broader sense. It's not only accuracy, it's also comparability. It's also uh, timeliness. It's also, uh, it's also uh, interpretability and so on. Um, the, this is a, our you know, main concern. The other, so to increase that as much as possible to be transparent in that as much as we can. The other, of course, we should never forget we, we are the UN, we are intergovernmental organization. And uh, so for us, it's, it's also cru equally crucial to maintain uh, a close link with the countries. We, we, maintain, uh, we maintain a sense of ownership of the data uh, by the countries, because this is, the, this is what we are doing. We are doing giving a service to them as well. So, between these two uh, uh, kind of uh, pillars, we, it's all our activity. Uh, it's all our activity to maintain, and we always try to strengthen, to maximize both of them. So um, with that, I will stop here. I will come in. It's interesting to see, that, again, really the results of this uh, small, uh, short uh, opinion poll. Um, but I, now I give the floor to my colleagues. It will be Hernan, who will talk to you about our main data collection, the ARQ annual report questionnaire. So that again, you can be a bit more familiar on how it works very briefly. Then uh, Diana, Diana Camerini will focus on two specific outputs of our data work. One is the, the, the work on drug uh, prevalence estimates and the trafficking, the drug trafficking routes. And then finally will be Francesca Massanello will talk about our, you know, the, what we are doing on the, uh, to improve, you know, also the data using uh, new, new technologies. So on, on based on a web, uh, web scraping methodologies. So now I give the floor to my colleague, first of all, Hernan, please go ahead. Enrico and Anna, just 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 uh, if I may here, we have Please. four we have four questions in the Q and in the okay. Q and A section. So so just to make sure that maybe Hernan and, and Diana, maybe your your presentation will answer those questions. But I just wanted you to take a look at them first. Maybe it, they are to be answered already now uh, by Enrico before we move on. If if I may invite you to do that, please. Mm -hmm. I, I suggest that, okay, maybe you suggest that Hernan goes ahead and then we take a look at the, at the Perfect, at the perfect, okay. excellent. Thanks so much, Enrico. Yeah. Hernan, please, please go ahead. Hey, thank you, Enrico. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, I will try to share my, my screen. Please let me know if, if you can see it. Yeah, we can see yeah. it. Perfect, perfect. Um, I think some of the questions will be responded with some of the with a part of this presentation. Um, so I will talk about the, the, this ARQ, the Annual Report Questionnaire, which is uh, our main data collection tool. Uh, this is uh, as uh, on drugs, as Chloe mentioned, and Enrico also mentioned. Uh, we collect data on the aggregate level uh, and also on the individual level. So we collect, for example, individual uh, data on seizures and Francesca will talk about this later, but I will focus more on the ARQ, which collects data at the aggregate level and at the annual level. Um, we recently went through a major uh, revision of the, of the questionnaire, which was um, endorsed by the CND, the Commission on, on, on Narcotics Drugs in 2020. Uh, before we used to do this data collection using these um, Excel files, which collected the same data every year, uh, and we've changed the structure in a way so that we can now collect data on an annual basis. So we divided all the data into different modules where we, we created different modules for, 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 for different topics. Um, here you can see some of them are collected annually. Uh, some of them are collecting, collected on, on a rotating basis. So some of them are collected every two, three or five years. On the right, you can see 
Uh, here you can also see what are the main uh, some of the main uh, indicators that we that we use in our analysis and that we collect. Uh, on demand, for example, uh, you have prevalence. We we collect a lot of data on, on prevalence, of course, on drug registries as well. Uh, people with uh, with injected with, who inject drugs people with drug use disorders, uh, mortality, treatment. So we collect data, a lot of very detailed data on all this information uh, from the demand side on an annual basis. And also from the demand, from the supply side, we also collect data on seizures and trafficking, laboratories detected, uh, cultivation and eradication, uh, price impurities. I think there was a question on, on uh, the use of medical substances. So we also have a rotating module, uh, as you can see, R13. Uh, here uh, on the on the on, on the rotating modules on access to control medication. So we also have collect information on um, on the on on the national frameworks, especially uh, on 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 how these these med these medications are controlled on a, on a national level. Um, also. We, the data we used to before collect um, on the demand side, now it's being collected, most of it on the, the quantitative information that was collected before on the demand side, is now mostly being collected on the, on annually on these, on these modules A, A01 to A06. Um, some of the information is also collected on rotating modules. This is the way we, did, we made the distinction was basically because we noticed that some of these data did not change that much from year to year. So we thought it could be asked every two, three, or five years, while some of the data did change every year. So these are the cases where we could continue collecting information on an annual uh, periodicity. Uh, from the supply side, we also the, all the, the most of the qualitative quantitative information we used to collect before uh, is being collected on on on, on an annual level, um, such as seizures, labs, cultivation, etc. Uh, the, most of the information that was more on the qualitative side, um, or some of the information that was mostly on the qualitative side, uh, is now being collected on the rotating level because this data does not change much from year to year. So we still collect the data, but uh, to decrease the burden on, on countries reporting, we decided to it was decided to collect it more on a on a spaced manner. You no, know? in addition. There's, of course, this revision is not just about reorganizing the data we were collecting before by any means. There's a lot of new information that we're collecting, uh, emerging issues that were not present before, such as, for example, as you can see on the annual module 11, cells on the internet. This is something that was not present in the previous ARQ, uh, but it's something that is present currently because it, it gained a lot of importance. And also there's some data that is not collected anymore because it was decided that it was not so relevant as it was in the past. Uh, with this new revision also came uh, a new method for collecting. Before we were using this Excel uh, and um, Word files. Now we're using a data, a web-based data collection platform. Um, this was recently developed and launched in uh, April 2021. So uh, we're still learning on how to use it and how to make the best out of it. Uh, but it's had, it's had a very good, uh, it's been received very well by, by countries, and it also allows for a direct uh, reporting through this platform. Uh, so before, as I mentioned, before we used to data, collect the data through Excel and Word files, now this web-based data collection. We also established uh, a network of, of focal points. So now we can talk directly to, um, to uh, technical experts in the countries. Before we used to communicate always via the permanent missions. Now uh, we connect with permanent missions, but also directly we have the, the option of, of communicating directly with focal points and national entities. Um, and of course, this and also this this platform also allows for uh, for monitoring of what the of what the status is in terms of, of uh, reporting uh, to the UNODC. Before this was not possible, but now permanent missions and everyone, uh, all the users in the in the country can access and see what that status is of the of the data submission. Uh, we also dedicated a lot of of time to training uh, users and member states on how to use this platform. We did over twelve trainings uh, in about six seven months, 
since April until now November and until December. Uh, we reached over 600 participants uh, from around 100 countries uh, so far. Uh, how is the, the data collection process? I mentioned this is an annual exercise. Um, so normally the, the, the data collection is launched in, uh, in May. Um, the, the deadline for submission for this year was at the end of July. Uh, of course, countries often um, report after this deadline, but we continue receiving the responses and taking them into account. Um, we do validation of the data. I will go a little more in detail about how this validation is done. We share the data with the countries now in December. So we're currently right now in the process of sharing the data we have uh, with countries um, uh, so that they can review this data. Uh, and, and they're also aware we also want to keep this very close communication and, trans and keep it transpar transparent what the process is with the countries. Um, we normally finalize, the, we will finalize the data set in April and publish in, in, in June. Um, so how is this data quality, this data validation that we do done? Uh, Chloe mentioned a little bit about this, about these additional data sources that we look for. So first, the data submitted by countries through the through the DXP, this uh, platform, uh, is validated by different means. Of course, we do basic checks of things that cannot, that are not probable, such as, for example, the prevalence of drug use of 90%. We know this is something that is very unlikely. So in these cases, we check back with the country. Um, we check for consistency with previous years. Again, if, if, if last year they reported a prevalence of 1%, and now the report 5%, we, this is a, a, red, a red flag, let's say. So we also get back to the country in these cases. Um, we also check with experts uh, within and outside, uh, within and outside in the, the house, and also with other sources. Uh, we also ensure uh, that the data is up to international standards and is comparable. So we look at the metadata. We, we ask a lot of questions on, on the metadata, on how this data is collected. Uh, what the definitions were used, uh, what were the sources used, uh, does it cover the whole country, what's the annual, the year of the data, et cetera. And also, like, they, like Chloe mentioned, we all not only use triangulation for analysis, but also for uh, validation. So if we have a case where we can see that uh, a prevalence um, translates into a number of users that is, for example, uh, lower than or the same as as, as, a as the number reported in, in registries, we know there could be an issue there because prevalence uh, is wider than what, what normally registries are. Um, then we also incorporate additional data sources. Uh, so we look, we spend a lot of time uh, going, looking for uh, doing research and looking for additional data sources. Uh, this includes also academia. So the, it do, it's not necessarily official uh documents as as chloe also mentioned uh just to give an example uh, in the data we have for heroin uh, annual prevalence use um about 10 percent of of the data we have of the latest estimate we have for countries we have about 130 uh estimate uh, countries and about 10 percent of those 13 come from academia uh, or from non-official government sources um, now, all this data is reviewed by member states, as mentioned, uh, to ensure the highest transparency and national ownership. We do this review directly with uh, focal points and technical counterparts through the, the, the DXP platform. Uh, and these, these, these discussions are always, of course, uh, at, the, at the technical level. level. Um, and we also use uh, complementary source from common sources to ensure consistency. So, for example, if we have to calculate uh, ratios uh, or rates, we always use the same source for the population, which in this case uh, is the UN. So we use official UN uh, values estimations for, for the population. What is the geographical coverage of the ARQ? In 2020, this is the, 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 the snapshot right now. So as of December 1st, uh, of course, this is the continuous process, so this will change definitely in the, in the next uh, few months. Uh, but you here you can see in, in orange, you can see the countries where we don't have any data. 
and in the other country in the in both purple and and green you can see uh countries where we have either all the data or some of the data as you can see there are some uh, some gaps especially uh, in africa and in, in in southwest asia uh in total we have about data for about 53 percent of the countries and 47 percent of the countries we don't have uh, any data submitted so far for 2020. I will go into detail a little bit into uh, the um, the prevalence uh, the prevalence data the prevalence data that we collect. So we we collect data from different sources, as you can see: household surveys, school or, school or university sources, uh, surveys, uh, and also indirect methods. Uh, but also we collect qualitative information because we know this data is not available in all countries. So many countries have uh, big data gaps in terms of prevalence, especially. Uh, so, uh, so what we do is we also collect, try to collect some information from them uh, in the form of qualitative questions. Here you can see uh, some some of these questions. There should be all countries should be able to answer these questions. So, for example, ranking of drugs uh, of which are the, the the most consumed, the most used drugs in the country, um, or trends if they think there was been an increase in the consume or uh, in the consumption or or a decrease or it stayed uh, stable. We also collect, as I said, uh, data, quantitative data. Um, so this is questions that normally many countries have them, but we know that not not all countries do. So lifetime prevalence um, by drug. By also by sex and by age. Uh, we also collect annual, monthly, and if countries have it, weekly and daily as well. Uh, in addition, as mentioned, we collect data from school service and, and indirect methods, which for, for certain, the use of certain drugs are normally preferred, for example, for the use of, for the calculation of, of, um, of heroin use prevalence, we prefer to use uh, indirect methods because we know that uh, household methods, uh, household service may may underestimate and may may be under coveraging this this population. Uh, we also ask uh, qualitative questions on uh, drug use in specific groups of the population, such as persons with disabilities, living in rural areas, etc., and uh, poly drug use uh, as well. And finally, what is the geographical coverage that we have for prevalence, for example? Um, as you can see here, you can see uh, for the for the prevalence of cannabis use uh, in the last five years, we only have data in, at the global level for 36% of the countries, and there's a big variety between different uh, different regions. So for Europe, we have 80%. But for regions like like Africa and Oceania, we have 13, 15%. This also has to do with the fact that these types of surveys are not done every year, of course. Uh, and for the last five years, in terms of heroin, the, 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 the availability is lower. So at the global level, we have about 21% of countries with data. And again, there's a big variation at the regional level. If we compare this with the data, with information we have for on the supply side, if you look at seizures, for example, uh, for the last five years, we have data for uh, about 75% of countries. So it's much higher at least when we compare seizures to prevalence, uh, the availability of data uh, um, on seizures. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, Enrico or Billy, uh, yeah, the, I'll go back to you. Thank you, thank you, Hernan. Um, I think, I, um, thanks a lot. I, I'm also looking at, um, uh, are there the questions in the chat in the Q and A uh, section? I we try to give answer directly in, in the in, by in writing to some of them. There are, uh, yeah, we will try to give answer now also orally. Maybe it's easier and faster. Um, before there is there are a few questions. That, something that we uh, on dissemination of data. We'd like to also emphasize that. Besides uh, the you know the. Um, the production of you know, the World Drug Report and other uh, analytical instruments, uh, we also um, produce uh, disseminated data as they are. So um, maybe I will also put in the chat the, the, the web, the, the link. So we have a, um, 
a portal where we disseminate the data. Um, my, I mean, they, a lot of indicators data at country level or also regional global level. Um, one thing that they, this is something that we are very much keen on expanding, yeah, more and more. Um, and also to, uh, and I know that uh, to make this access to data as more, you know, uh, technologically advanced as possible. So this is an area where uh, we also, we, I think, you know, again, we, uh, we really try to put everything that we uh, collect, our, this is our principle, everything that we collect, once it's validated, um, you know, uh, processed, we make uh, accessible to the international community. But also, yeah, we are also, we, we will work also to make it more and more uh, technically uh, sound, this access. Uh, with this, um, yeah, Diana, we had a prepared a few, you had prepared a few, just a couple of examples on uh, for you, for the people, our colleagues uh, and friends to understand with the type of work we do to, I mean, to analyze and to produce analytical, you know, analytical outputs uh, for, uh, for users. Diana, please. Thank you, Enrico. Thanks to everyone. And uh, thanks for attending this event. Um, I am going to present now um, two major analytical outputs we have. Uh, the first one is the estimates of prevalence of drug use uh, at the regional and global level. Uh, but also we have other outputs starting from uh, prevalence data. And the second one is going to be trafficking flow maps starting from supply data and especially from seizure data and trafficking uh, flow uh, information that have communicated yearly on a yearly basis by member states. I'm going to present, uh, share my presentation in a second. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Um, just confirm that my presentation is visible, um, hopefully, in full screen mode. Yes. Um, it's not in full screen? Not in full screen. Okay, let me just share another screen. Um, just one second. Stop presenting now and swap uh, the screen, maybe screen number three, no, two. Then this presentation should be in full mode. Um, Otherwise, it's okay. Hopefully, it's visible okay. now. It's okay. Right? It's okay. It's okay. Okay, perfect. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to focus on uh, main outputs, starting from the prevalence of drug use data we collect on an annual basis based on submission of data by member states and also on intensive data search process uh, from external data sources, mostly official, but also from academic and other sources and on trafficking flow maps. Um, as you most likely know, uh, one of the main epidemiological indicator to measure drug use is the, and there is this agreement among the scientific community is the prevalence of drug use among the general population. And uh, our major indicator we focus on is the current use, which we collect every year. And we focus on consumption of drugs in the past 12 months. And this indicator indicates how many people have been consuming drugs uh, at least once in the past 12 months. The prevalence of drug use is um, a, an indicator that is in general, as said already by Chloe, calculated or collected somehow uh, and estimated by member states and by usually by national institutions. So we rely on mainly uh, secondary data and other data sources can be academic institutions or specialized agencies which um, use or administer uh, surveys among households uh, and among the general population and also school survey data. Uh, prevalence of drug use is also estimated starting from indirect methods, which works for certain drugs, uh, such as especially opiates, through, for example, capture recapture. And uh, as said already by Chloe, is uh, data are collected as a byproduct of the action of uh, health service, for example, in uh, uh, active in harm reduction or treatment. What we do with this data? 
uh, UNEDC works to collect such data, uh, to publish such data at the national level as they are, of course, after a validation uh, and assessment of the quality of data and a discussion of all the details with member states. So we publish uh, tables uh, about national data on prevalence of drug use for each drug, but also we produce important outputs, uh, which are uh, produced by us, by UNODC, um, as uh, important as for regional estimates of drug use based on available data and global estimates on prevalence of drug use and on the number, global number of users, probably if you have consulted the World Drug Report, you will have already have seen uh, what is the estimated global number of drug users, uh, which is an estimate we publish every year. And also we produce estimates on uh, problematic drug use and number of problematic drug users. Uh, just to give you an example on what are, uh, how we produce this estimate, what is the main result, but also what is the input we use to produce such estimate. As Hernan said before, um, countries are challenged by producing such data, but also by communicating such data to UNDC. And the major challenge probably would be data production. So uh, collecting estimate, collecting data on drug use and producing estimates is a really, uh, let's say, resource intensive work. And uh, we receive, therefore, uh, as Hernan illustrated before, only a limited number of data every year. Uh, so for producing regional estimates, we will try to rely to whatever we have and whatever we receive. So on average, every year we receive new estimates for about 20, 40 countries uh, for certain type of drugs. For, for example, cannabis is the type of drugs for which there is more research available and more data are collected by member states, but also by other uh, experts or specialized agencies. And um, when we produce regional and global estimates, uh, we rely on uh, available data that for the last five, five ten years cover mostly uh, 60, almost around 60% uh, of global population. So based on available data and based on extrapolation, we produce data uh, and estimates at the sub-regional and regional level. Whenever this is possible, of course, because in case data are not updated, we don't publish, for example, estimate at the sub-regional level for certain sub-regions. And due to the limited uh, availability of data and on the inner, let's say, natural uncertainty of uh, such estimates uh, from their collection or differences between um, data collected from one country to the other, we want to publish not only what we call best estimates, so central estimates, but also uh, we produce and publish ranges of uh, estimated number of and estimated prevalence by region and at the global level. Main challenges and possible solution to uh, the production, the collection first of such data and then the production of estimates is that the international community, international organization, but also everyone should really um, think and uh, understand that there is countries have very limited capacity to conduct often to conduct national white house survey on a regular basis. Let's say, let's say for example, Europe, most of the European countries produce uh, or um, administer survey among the general population every three to four years. Um, very rare cases, in very rare cases, uh, countries produce estimates or conduct studies on a yearly basis. And this is, uh, implies that uh, we should look also to other, um, to other methods to provide these, to look at these estimates and to produce estimates. And um, also we should consider that other methods to estimate drug use should be also uh, looking into that for certain drugs, while also not always the house of survey are always useful for producing estimates uh, on let's say opiates, for example, uh, at the regional level, but also at the national level. The solution and uh, we propose is that that they should be somehow developed and implemented alternative methods to estimate drug use. And of course, we are more and more oriented to try to look more into research and existing 
knowledge uh, among uh, scholars to see what are alternative methods. And also, on the other hand, in the data production side, uh, provide technical assistance and uh, in some cases also support to member states that face the major challenging to um, produce this data, to collect data in the field, to collect information and produce estimates, both at the, especially at the national level. And then at the same time, what we would like to highlight is that there, it's important to raise a broad and public awareness about the importance of drugs data and hard data for policymaking. How much policymaking should be oriented looking by data and how much policymaking should support more uh, policies oriented in the collection of hard data using uh, scientific methods. In terms of data collection, even if we face challenges, uh, such as, let's say, not always the countries have the capacity not, not to collect data, but also to uh, communicate data to us. And uh, data not always can be shared. Uh, there are limited challenges. There are a number of challenges on that. There should be uh, somehow an improvement of outreach activities. Uh, there should be uh, leveraging and the establishment of national networks and communities. So the international communities should be more and more engaged into leveraging on the importance of such data. And also the RQ focal points that Hernan mentioned before uh, should be regularly assessed and uh, should be uh, engaged by everyone uh, at all levels. Regarding instead the trafficking flow maps, which is uh, really important, I think an interesting output of uh, the data we collect uh, and result of the analysis we do on uh, drug supply and especially on um, uh, drug seizures so the amount of drug seizures but also the direction uh, that these drugs take took uh, looking at the for example origin transit or destination of uh, such drugs uh, based on this uh, and also based on integrated data from individual drug seizures or uh, other official documents from member states, uh, we produce uh, uh, trafficking flow maps at the national level by identifying the countries of, uh, as this map, the countries of uh, source of uh, or transit of drugs. In this specific case, we talked about uh, a shipment of heroin. And on uh, destination, which are the major country of destination based on available data and submitted by the country based on the seizures each country make, but also based on, as mentioned uh, before by Chloe, by uh, triangulating the data. So seeing uh, what other countries report to about other, for example, countries where the drugs originated or where the drugs are destined for. And another important output we produce is the uh, sub-regional um, level map, uh, which is uh, a map focusing on flows, depending on the amount of seizures we had uh, and uh, at the sub-regional level that indicate um, and classify somehow uh, the major flows into low and high volume flows. Such data are the result of a compilation of a complex matrices um, of uh, um, origin destination. Uh, and uh, the inputs used, as I was saying, was uh, not only the amount of drugs seized by every country and what is being communicated to us, but also data on trafficking routes. Uh, on the annual report questionnaire, we have a module on drug seizures and routes, and particularly a sub-module where we talk about, we ask information about the distribution or the major uh, indicating as we uh, at the moment in, to indicate the major countries of departure transit of destination of the drug seas in the country. And also we integrate this data with individual drug seizures or other um, country reports from specialized agents. Major challenges for producing such maps and uh, for also improving uh, the analytical output we have out of this is that Though we have, we know we have a data, better data availability on drug supply uh, and on general on drug seizures than drug demand, still we face major challenge on the availability of timely data. And I think my colleague Francesca is gonna talk about uh, this issue or this topic, interesting topic better uh, later on. Um, 
And the fact that trafficking routes are complex and uh, the data we rely on for producing trafficking flow maps are based on evidence from law enforcement and lab evidence based on their efforts. So as Chloe was saying before, uh, these data are data based on action of policy or uh, of law enforcement agencies. And uh, it depends on their capacity, both to detect the drugs itself and to seize the drugs, but also to understand what, where, where, what is the routing, to identify where the drugs come from and where they are destined to. And countries face different capacity across the globe and across different regions. And this is the major challenge that we need to uh, somehow improve through better data collection, but also through improving the capacity of various uh, law enforcement agency in the detection of such and in the identification of such information. Um, but just to say that positive news would be that, as I said, better data availability is uh, on the drug uh, supply side is uh, is there. So, for example, for cocaine. Um, we can count, uh, usually we produce maps on a five years period. And so far for the period 2016 to 2020, even if it's not closed, uh, we have data for at least uh, a couple of years on uh, for cocaine seizures of, from 141 countries and for heroin for um, 130 countries at least so far. So we hope that uh, your action and somehow our action could help us to leverage more on the data collection and raise awareness on this. And I will uh, close here and give the floor to you. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks Enrico. And thank for you. any questions, um, we are ready here for. Thank you, um, Diana. Thank you so, so much. So I, I think uh, you can have now, having uh, watched the two presentations from, uh, from Hernan, and Diana, you can appreciate uh, the work and the, the type of uh, activities that lay, lie behind a, a simple, what looks like a simple chart or looks like a nice uh, colored uh, uh, map of the world. So you see, you know, the data, the, the, all the work that is behind the collecting the data, processing, and analyzing. Uh, this information. Um, Billy, I, I, there should be another question uh, ready, question number two, uh, so that now that people have a, a, some understanding of the data uh, we have, maybe they can are in a better position to answer to this, uh, um, yeah, to this kind of question. So what could UNODC do to improve its data on, on drugs? So and you can see the different options that uh, uh, we came up with. So use data from civil society, use data from the academia, engage with countries to improve national data, provide capacity building activities, use more innovative data sources such as big data, data other. Um, yeah, again, your first thought on this, if you were us, if you were here sitting in this place, what would you do tomorrow? <laughs> that's the um, that's the question that we are asking you. And I one thing that uh, when I look at the, at the questions that you were asked in the you were asking in the in the in the chat in the Q and A uh, section, uh, there were, for example, questions about how we um, what we do to improve. You know, data from spe specific areas, for example, here, Africa uh, and the Southeast Asia were mentioned. And, uh, you know, um, we see uh, when we, we work in, in um, especially in developing uh, countries, regions, we try to have these two, uh, um, two tiers approach. First, to try to have the uh, whatever is available in the short term, try really to improve communication improve communication at country level, improve communication from the country to here, improve partnerships with the regional organizations, so that because there are in all the regions, the world, there are you know, regional organizations that are often closer to the country. So to improve the communication so that whatever is available there can get to surface, get, get, can get here at the global level. So this is one. And then of course, there are more longer term uh, strategies to, you know, to improve capacities, to conduct, for example, to support countries in doing service and so on. This is also another area where we are also very much active, but as you can understand, this is more 
demanding in terms of resource. So funding is always uh, an issue here, and we always uh, uh, look, raise uh, very actively for funding in this area. So going back to the, the question, yeah, I see that we see that the, um, uh, the suggestions coming from you is that we should use you know, more data from the academia, uh, from CSO organizations, civil society organizations, um, engage with countries, uh, capacity building, use more innovative data sources, and so on. And we, it's interesting uh, uh, to, yeah, to see again uh, your, your, your suggestions. And, the, you know, something that maybe uh, we already try to uh, emphasize that uh, we, in a way, we are always trying to do uh, what you are suggesting. So, for example, using data from the academia uh, or even from civil society organizations, um, for us, uh, um, the, you know, what is paramount importance is the quality. And then, uh, when, when, so when so compliance with some you know methodological standards and so on. And then, as ex Hernan was explaining, is a, we have also a review process that goes. So whatever we are using as data. Uh, as always, we always give the chance, the countries the opportunity to co to comment and to review. Um, but yeah, it's very good to um, to see your suggestions, and uh, I also see that uh, it's very high uh, here, uh, in the ranking the use of a more innovative data sources. And so it's uh, you know very timely the <laughs> the presentation from Francesca last presentation, Fran on which will uh, tell you a bit of what we are doing to improve. Um, uh, to expand in this area. Thank you, Enrico. Let me just open up my presentation. Uh, can you see my Enrico? screen? Excellent, we can see that. Uh, Enrico, as, as Francesca is preparing her presentation, uh, there's a question that you could reflect in, in a chat, which is related to the link to the data portal that you ah, that you okay. have put in it in the chat, uh, whether society can contribute to that. Maybe you can reflect on that in the meantime. Sure. Excellent. Francesca, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Billy. So um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in terms of making use of big data and innovative technologies. Um, I deal specifically with um, a data set, a drug data set that looks at what we call individual seizures. Um, and what that means is we look at every single case of a seizure, of a drug seizure that takes place in the country. And we realized, and you know, Diana and, and, and Hernan have emphasized already, there are some limitations to the data. You know, we work as hard as we can with, with the member states, with the countries to try and improve data collection. But we realized that we had a gap, uh, especially for the work that I'm, I'm dealing with. So we decided we wanted to try and pursue making use of big data. Um, to try and complement the existing information that we have on hand. So of course, this brought up a few questions that we tried to answer. How can we improve our geographic coverage of the data? How can we improve linguistic coverage? Because you know, not everything is in one language. Then there's the issue of how do you process all of this data and how do we make sure it's of good quality? So what we started doing is we started um, embarking on what we call web scraping activities. So we, we basically put spiders um, to websites and try to collect all this data. And then we make use of what we call machine learning models. So this is a, a form of artificial intelligence to try and transform this data. So just to give you a picture of what this means is how could we then take this, what we call unstructured qualitative data. So from a narrative text from the web, you know, try to identify an event that's relevant for us related to a drug seizure how to turn that into data, so into something quantitative, and then at the end have a statistic that we can use. And the other reason we really started looking into this use of, you know, an innovative approach to complementing the data that we have is that, you know, we hear more and more people talking about we need real-time data. Um, and again, as Hernan and Diana were talking about it, I'm sure Chloe touched upon as well. I apologize, I came a little bit late. You know, we, we have these fantastic data collections that we handle here in UNODC, but these, of course, can be heavy and they take time. So, you know, you have this challenge of how do you fill this gap in information? And this is where open data can really make a huge difference. So just to give you a sense of what this has meant for us in practical terms, 
you can see here on the right, um, when we were just looking um, at using open data manually, so you know, going to search sites on our own, this was the kind of coverage we had around the world. And in the, on the left side, you can see what we have now in terms of coverage, um, now that we've started using web scraping. So what does this mean practically? So we're not, you know, there are still certain challenges. There's capacity, there's access to information and other things. So we're hitting roughly about 150 countries around the globe, and we have about close to 20,000 sources um, that we're making use of right now, just using open data. So this has really improved our coverage overall around the globe. In terms of the sources that we're, ewing, re we're using, we're relying primarily on government websites, um, media sites, and now we're also using a select amount of social media. So what I mean by that is um, specific handles on Twitter, um, as well as Facebook that are linked specifically to the government, not to individuals. Um, and this is just a, the same illustration, just another way. So here is to give you a sense of, you know, where we have no data right now based on um, the web scraping activities we're conducting. And you can see that we've really had a dramatic difference um, of being able to cover much more of the globe than we used to before. One caveat I'd like to mention here, of course, from this map, it doesn't really tell you how many sources we have for each country. But I also just like to emphasize that when it comes to using big data, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need, you know, 100 sources from one single country to make your data rich, complete, and of good quality. It just takes even a few samples to, to give you that, um, that richness that you're looking for. So what have we been able to do? So I mentioned that we use these machine learning models. So what we do with those machine learning models is we basically take all the information that we're scraping from the web and we need to transform it. And we have to teach each of these models, okay, we want to extract this specific piece of information. So in this example that you have here on drugs, we have a model that can extract basically the name of the drug, the, the quantity, the unit of measurement, um, where the seizure physically took place. So not just geographically, but also in terms of a location. So was it in an airport? Was it at a port somewhere else? And it also picks up information related to concealment. So how were the drugs hidden? So it's given us a lot of information that's very rich for us and has you know, cut down the time um, that it would take us to try and find all of this information individually. And we're continuing to grow our models. You know, it's, it's a living process essentially. And the main takeaway I wanted to give you here, you know, it has presented some fantastic advantages for us, but also a number of challenges as well. And I just wanted to highlight a few of them here for you. So um, right now, I mentioned language um, was an issue at the beginning. Now we're translating from 53 languages from these articles. However, as much as you scrape, there will always be a certain limitation. You know, you can't scrape every single site in the world. So, you know, you have to find other mechanisms also to continue to collect this data. I mentioned that we were able to improve our coverage at a global level. Um, and the one thing I really wanted to mention in, in what we've learned from the web scraping is that, you know, of course, as you scrape more and more, you're having to process more and more. So basically you have to main, make sure you're always maintaining your IT infrastructure. So we have to maintain the models, they're living, they have to continue to learn, we have to make sure that they don't break down and you need a set of IT infrastructure. Um, and some of the other things, you know, source quality is something that we're asked about quite a bit. And what I mean here is how can we be sure that this is good data that we're drawing from? So, you know, we, we've put in, pay, in place a number of methodologies on how we select our sources, um, how we prioritize and so on, so on and so forth. And then also just to handle all of this data and to process it, we have three main areas that we work on. We had to put together an annotation policy. So basically we had to put in place, you know, we had to train a lot of data to understand what can we consider relevant information. We also had to apply normalization. So basically we had to set up our own standards and classification and create what we call living libraries that keep feeding the models. And then um, we also had to apply standardization to identify common errors, you know, whether it's spelling, the way a unit is, a unit of measurement is um, explained and so on. And then last but not least, something that has been particularly tricky and that we spend a lot of time working on is 
what we call deduplication. You know, with this vast volume of information, when you have a, you know, a high profile seizure, let's say, it's gonna get repeated again and again and again through the media and government websites. So we have to make sure that we have techniques in place to eliminate these duplicates so that we're not generating the same piece of information over and over again. So you may be wondering, what are we practically doing with this information? So we happen to have this, uh, we have a platform that we work with called the Drugs Monitoring Platform. And it's based primarily on these individual seizures. So it's an online geocoded system. We have close to 500,000 data points on there. Um, we basically, we collect the data, we visualize it and we disseminate it through the platform. Um, and we use it to monitor drug trafficking trends. So it gives us an additional insight um, that can feed into the World Drug Report. I'll touch upon that in my next slide. And we can use it for other information that, we, that is available for countries. Here you have a representation. We've, we've produced some briefs um, based on the data we've been able to collect. So this is one example here that was um, all about um, drug trafficking groups. And then, um, Chloe, I apologize if you already mentioned this, but um, I'm hoping not. Um, you know, the information also feeds into the World Drug Report and other publications. So it's, it's really a tool that we can use across the house here in UNODC. Here are a couple of examples for you from last year's World Drug Report, well, this year's World Drug Report, the 2021 report. And this was specifically the, the booklet that was dedicated to COVID. So we were able to build from this data, from this open data, these rapid pictures to have a sense of what was happening in the first year of COVID in terms of drug trafficking. And if it's particularly interesting here for the map for Africa, you, not just the continuity of the trafficking throughout COVID, but this clear trend where you can see, you know, there's um, the cannabis in the North, the cocaine in the West, as well as, you know, um, amphetamines and then amphetamines and heroin in the, the East. And the last thing I wanted to say before I close, I'll just put this slide because I've put some information here for, for your reference. You know, COVID was really, um, I wanted to tie this in for you. COVID was really an important trigger for us here in UNODC. We had already, we had been talking about making use of this big data for the drug seizures, but we realized with COVID, it wasn't just about the drug seizures. You know, there was a lot of pressure on us here in UNODC to, to figure out what was going on in the early stages of COVID. So we also used this approach to put in place a, a really rapid, I would say, data collection to look at the, um, the trafficking of falsified medical products. So all this is to say that, you know, it presented, also presented an opportunity for us to push ourselves in a different way and how we can use these kind of innovative approaches to think outside of the way we, we do traditional data collections. And in fact, this is something that we'll now be exploring for other areas um, related to gender-based violence, um, potentially cultural trafficking, um, cultural heritage trafficking, and even applying it to other forms of crime, whether it be firearms and, and wildlife as well. So I hope I didn't take too much time and thanks very much for the opportunity. Thanks so much, uh, Francesca, for that. And then we go, of course, we know Chloe needs to go right away. Chloe, if you could take the floor before you leave us. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, everyone. So um, I apologize, but I need to I need to join another call. But before I'm uh, I'm leaving, I just wanted to say two words. One is about rebounding on the on the very I mean on the exact example that Francesca brought us, the uh, drug monitoring platform. You have seen here that even if it's built on uh, official data from the IDS, we uh, enrich the system with a lot of data and more than the official one uh, from open sources, etc. So this is a beautiful example of complementing what we get through the member states uh, with other data. And I wanted also to uh, mention uh, something else in regard to the uh, civil society organization. There is one uh, set of estimates, the estimates on people who inject drugs and also HIV in those people and hepatitis in those people. That is uh, the result of a joint collaboration between UNODC, WHO, UNAIDS and World Bank. And the process of uh, arriving at these estimates, both at national level in the sub-region and in the region, 
is also a process that engages very heavily the civil society organization. And I say that because you may not be aware of it, but basically the data set is sent to civil society organizations and, and they have a, an opportunity to review and to send any other estimates they would be aware, et cetera. And this is channeled through the Harm Reduction International. So it's just for you to, to know that such processes exist already. And then I wanted also to mention that even if the, so this webinar is on data and data is not the same as analysis. And this is something I really want to emphasize because here and uh, Enrico's and team have uh, perhaps not Francesca, but at least Enrico, Hernan and, uh, and uh, Diana, they have uh, mostly emphasized what is a regular data collection, which is the backbone of any publication we may have, and which is based on official reporting from the member state. But when we use this data and when we produce research report and research product, we don't only use that. And I want really to emphasize that because it's extremely important. And it's not only, as Anna mentioned, that 10% of the prevalence estimates, I think it was for heroin, uh, may come from the academia. In some areas, it's much more. And I'm not talking about estimates here. I'm talking about when we answer some research questions, some of the data may not come at all from official data that are submitted through the IQ. As you can imagine, the IQ has to be limited. Of course, us as researchers, we would have, we would like a 10 times bigger IQ to collect much more but we can't, the member states are going to kill us if we go into this direction. So we have done the minimum that is uh, acceptable for them, but is enough for us to have the backbone of our, of our reporting. And this is what is then translated into the, the data portal that Enrico, Enrico shared the link through the, um, through the chat, I think. But there is much more. So I really invite you to go through our uh, research publications. And something also very important, we are extremely transparent. We have made a very big effort in the last uh, five years so that all our publications reference very uh, transparently the sources for all the statements and all the data we use. So this is, and then you will see that uh, there is a, a big richness here. I have to leave you. But I'm, uh, I'm very enthusiastic to see how many you were in the webinar today. And I will leave you with my colleagues. And I'm sure they will be more than capable to answer all the questions. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. And of course, you will be back, right? You will be back next time. This is only the first uh, webinar. And uh, we will be looking to, to have you at uh, the next one, of course. I uh, thank you so much for those also encouraging, uh, let's say, almost uh, closing remarks. But we have. Uh, a few, at least one more question to answer before we go. Thanks so much, Chloe. Thank you. Yeah, again, really. Thank you, Chloe. And uh, yeah, before we go, we are really at the end of the, of this uh, nice uh, meeting with you. Uh, we had a, a, a yeah, we had thought about a propose a, pro a question for you. So, what uh, could the civil society organizations do to improve national and global data on drugs? Yeah. So. Um, so far, we have sp spoken about a lot, maybe even too much about us. Yeah, so the idea is also to, to see what you can do as a, also primary users of this type of, uh, uh, of information. So uh, what you could do, for example, if we have put some ideas here, produce alternative data and analysis based on non-official sources, engage with the international regional organizations to understand or improve their data, conduct capacity building activities at national level, increase public awareness about the importance of data. Uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, these are the five, yes. Yeah, so we know we can do a little bit of everything, but we, yeah, we were uh, also curious to see what you think. And while you answer, there were just a couple, I wanted to just a couple of questions. Um, maybe there is, there was one, Hernan, and you can reply on, uh, um, there was a, on a, a coverage of uh, the, the map you showed uh, on the coverage of uh, ARQ. Uh, it was somebody asking about Madagascar, but again, that is uh, what, what we have received so far, but maybe you can say something on, on this, on the, what the, how to interpret correctly that, that map on, on, on the ARQ yeah. uh, data yeah, submissions. So the question was in Madagascar. Then I I, I couldn't yeah. find it. 
Okay. Okay. Was in the chat. So yeah, it, it's it's. So this means so Madagascar was on 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 the map was uh, in orange. So this means they have not yet started providing data for 2020. So they may have provided data. This is this is the status currently of the current data cycle. But they it definitely uh, doesn't mean that the country has not uh, responded to the ARQ in previous years. It just means that this year. As of to the as of first of December, we have not received any data from this country. Uh, but again, we, we're continuing working with um, with our regional offices within UNODC, with countries, with focal points, trying to get these these data. Uh, but this, yeah, so that okay. that's pretty much what it means. Okay, thank you. So yeah, you know this this what we report is what countries have reported to us to UNODC. But uh, you know uh, data can be also available. Uh, and uh, and of course, this is one of the main, the first challenge we always try to, to address, the communication with us. And then there was another question concerning, you know, uh, how we work with other international, regional organizations and so on. Um, again, very shortly, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, we always uh, try to use this principle, the same, the one data is collected only once, yeah. Uh, internationally, so uh, this is where we are going towards too. So we would like to um, not to ask twice uh, the same question to the to countries, so that uh, we, as international regional organizations, coordinate among ourselves, so that we avoid that um, to reduce the burden, to reduce the possibility of, of, of having you know conflicting data on, on countries. Uh, this is uh, at the same time um, you have to be aware that this is a, a you know not always easy because every international regional organization has a, uh, often mandates uh, uh, tasks core tasks assigned so uh, from different countries different groups of countries these are not always very you know consistent yeah so but uh, please be assured that we always try to uh, to do this not so to not to ask the same question twice and um, and we are again more and more engaged with uh, all other international whether it is who or others at the regional level to uh, improve the the data uh, and also make them more more comparable um yeah so i see looking at looking at your uh, answers i see that you are very much willing to help us that's very good Producing data and uh, analysis uh, yourself, that's uh, that's very good. Uh, on the one hand, yeah, we are all so we will have another uh, source of information. And uh, uh, now that you have uh, reached us, you uh, you you have got to know us. You can also yeah, we have created this additional channel of communication. So please uh, always be uh, aware, free to reach out to us. For of course, you have a, uh, for us that, as I said, there are two things that are really always two criteria is the you know that we use in the, in the for reviewing the data, the quality, so compliance with standards, and then we also always have to uh, give uh, countries the possibility to review the data we are finally using. But uh, it's also uh, you know, we often think that uh, uh, NGOs can do also a lot, also for the other um, I, you know, activities that we uh, we uh, underline, we propose here. And uh, for example, using the data, engaging with the national authorities, and so so um, so that they, they, they on their own uh, start producing, improve the data they 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 entitled uh, to do. Um, so I, I would stop here, uh, also because I mean, we are a little bit late. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you. Okay. I would like to thank also my colleagues, <laughs> uh, Hernan, Diana, Fran, uh, and Billy, I think that people can still ask, ask questions if in case they are, um, they are willing to do so. So we will be happy to also to uh, answer to you uh, in the next few days. Uh, for us, it's, uh, yeah, it's the first time we had this kind of uh, uh, meetings. It's, uh, we definitely are engaged not to, to be the last one. Uh, on the contrary, to have more of these sessions, of, of both on drugs, but also on other topics. 
uh, we believe that it's uh, really important that uh, you we want to in a way appreciate the, the work we do the challenges we are facing but also be really sure that we always try to uh, to do the best in terms of you know providing you with the best possible data and also again to be as much transparent uh, really as possible uh, in doing this um thank you again and billy i give it uh, over to you Thank you so much, Enrico. Thank you so much uh, to you. And of course, Chloe, who just left, and um, Diana and Francesco for your time. I think, honestly, I think this, this has been really wonderful to, to see uh, the sheer number of participants here, also, which I think uh, shows the importance of this particular session. So as you said, Enrico, it's only the first uh, uh, a session that we're holding, we will hold more of these kind of sessions. We can diversify and bring in different uh, uh, contexts as well to this to this event. So thank you so much uh, to you and your team. And I think we have understood that this uh, the work that uh, the research branch does to collect and analyze data is not an easy one. I think um, was it Francesca who said uh, that um, it could um, uh, it could be heavy and it could take time. I would say, Francesca, it is heavy and it takes time. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so I think it was was very important also for colleagues to to get this understanding. Why does do, do they receive data late? You know, because it takes time to collect it. It needs to be uh, it needs to be analyzed. It need it needs to be validated so so that they can get the best data that is there possible. Because we want to to present the best evidence that is out there. So, thank you so much uh, to all of you uh, participants. Uh, I just wanted to invite the, the, the chair of the Vienna NGOC to just say the, the last final words for this particular event, because I know that the Vienna NGO committee has played a very important role also in making this event possible. Jimmy, you are with us. Please, the floor is yours for the final words. Oh, thank you so much, Billy. And it's been a brilliant session. So thank you so much to all our UNODC colleagues. Uh, it's been really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I know we're over time, so I, I won't be too long, but just to say, I really appreciate the initiative. Uh, I know this is one of a series of these webinars, so I'm, really, I'm definitely looking forward to the, to the others in the series as well. And I'm really pleased that Chloe mentioned that mechanism that already exists around the HIV and, um, and drug use data, because uh, as a civil society representative, that's been my personal uh, engagement with the um, ARQ data and the UNODC data so far and that's been a really welcome um kind of collaboration and hopefully i i, I hope you uh you and ODC colleagues would agree that it's been a productive one as well and you know to echo i think what kenzie's been saying in the q a and in the chat you know i think there there is a real opportunity to expand that beyond just the hiv data and you know civil society i think can really play a role in in reality checking some of the data quality checking some of the data but also you know, providing some some really useful, invaluable information on not just what exists, but what quality is it? You know, so it's it's all well and good saying these treatment services exist, but but are they really doing the best they can? And I think we have a really important role to play. So just from my side, once again, Billy and all the speakers today, it's been a really, really interesting session. Uh, I really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. Okay, rendezvous next time, you will get the information. And uh, in the meantime, please stay safe, be well, and uh, see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.